Good afternoon. Today we're going to have an interesting discussion on how to help new managers or people who are new managers get started. And today I have with me Eric Gerard. He's the CEO of Gerard Training Solutions. He works a lot in this area. So Gerard, welcome to Managers Club. Hey, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. It's great to have you. Tell us a little bit, how did you get interested in this, like helping new managers? Yeah, so I've been in learning and development my entire career, which is over 30 years. And I got into management development when I moved to Silicon Valley in 1999. And so I was simultaneously teaching people how to be managers. And then I was also being managed because I was an individual contributor. And I had some excellent, excellent managers that, that did a great job. And I had some just terrible managers who had clearly been promoted beyond their level of comfort or competence, kind of the, the Peter principle. Yeah. And I just, I did not like being managed by someone who, who hadn't been trained, who didn't have the experience to, to lead a team well. And so I, I started, you know, storing these little nuggets of things that had come up where I was like, man, I wouldn't do it that way. And then in a stroke of irony, I got promoted to be a manager. I got promoted over my, my team at Applied Materials and started leading a couple of people who were previously my peers. And I did absolutely everything wrong. I completely messed it up. And so I walked away from that experience going, okay, never again. That's never going to happen to me. That's never going to happen to another team member again. And so fast forward uh, to 2020 when I decided to hang on my own shingle and, and focus squarely on helping new managers transform from being high-performing individual contributors to great people managers. I think that's a great thing because I'm also very passionate about helping managers because if you can help a manager, it has such an effect like on the whole team. And and boy, haven't we had like, I think most people think a lot of their managers are terrible, right? So there's a lot to learn from the, the bad examples, things you don't want to do. Uh, so speaking of terrible managers, I want to jump into what are some common mistakes that managers make, particularly new managers, and how should you avoid them? Yeah, so I think the first thing that a lot of managers don't do is they don't mentally make that transition from, I am an employee responsible for tasks, you know, my job is to get the TPS report done every Friday afternoon sort of a thing. They, they don't move from being responsible from tasks to focusing on getting things done through a team. Because it's, it's not about you as a as an individual anymore, when you're a manager, it's about how you get results through your team. And so many people skip that step. They don't make that transition. They try to do everything themselves. Exactly. So, yeah. So they wind up not delegating. They don't set the team up for success. And, and people are, they're like, I don't know what to, I don't know what's expected of me. I don't know what to do. Uh, and it causes real problems off the bat. If the manager sort of continues with that hero mentality of, I will fix it. I will do it. So that's number one. I, th I think that's great because, yes, that's one of the hardest challenges, right? Because lots of times they were promoted because they're the best engineer and they're the best qualified person to do the job or the task, but now they have to learn to let that go. Yeah, absolutely. That's So thing number one is folks don't make the transition. And and that's that's really damaging in itself because it demoralizes the rest of the team. So I would I would first encourage folks to to mentally make that shift from it's not about me and what I produce, it's about my team and how I encourage them to produce and set them up in the best possible way. The second thing that I see managers slip on, and I mentioned this in my book, is they then don't set goals. They don't use the smart or OKRs or or any solid goal setting methodology to let their team know what's expected and who does what, how much and by when. And so if we don't set that sort of baseline, then everybody's going to go off in different directions doing what they think is best. You know, I always assume positive intent. You know, people are doing, they're trying to do their best, but if they don't understand which way north is, then the team scatters and the manager gets frustrated and the manager's manager gets frustrated and it's bad news. It's so funny you mentioned that because, yeah, it's like a basic thing, right, to set a goal and a plan, but you kind of forget that, right? Because if you're not used to doing that, then you managers, yeah, they'll just skip it. They will. They, they, you know, they either skip it because they don't think it's important or they skip it because they don't know any better. They just don't understand that you've got to make sure that the team understands, first off, what's our mission? What are we here to achieve? Why do we exist? 
And then what are our goals? And what is each of us going to do in order to achieve that mission? And so if we have a North Star to march toward, then we're much more likely to achieve it. So that's that's the second thing I see um, managers not doing. Could, could I add, I think, too, there may be deadlines, too. That's yeah. the thing that new managers and managers are sometimes hesitant to give, like, aggressive deadlines. Yeah, and, and deadlines are a big part of goals. You know, it, who does what, how much, and by when. So specify a date. Um, a lot of folks will say, well, write a SMART goal. And at the end of it, they'll say, you know, this needs to be done by the end of the quarter. Well, your definition of end of the quarter and my definition of end of the quarter might be slightly different, which can cause friction. And so if you just take that ambiguity out and say it needs to be done by September 30th, okay, understood. You know, we're, we're not going to waffle over a couple of days or a week. It's like September 30th, it needs to be done. And either you did it or you didn't. Yeah, it's so great you mentioned that because I had a VP I really like. And he was like, I don't want to hear like end of the quarter because everything's always end of the quarter. Like I want to hear like June 15th, July 7th. You know, I want an actual day. So. Yep, absolutely. One of the other things that I see managers not doing, and this, this ties into what I'm talking about with making the transition, is that they don't delegate. They, they, they try to hang on to everything because the, the, the mindset goes, it'll be faster and it'll be better if I just do it myself. You know, obviously I was the best one at being an engineer. I was the best engineer on the team. I can do this better and faster than anybody else who works for me. So I'll just do it. So you wind up being a horrible bottleneck and you're denying your team the opportunity to develop. I mean, you want to you want to set yourself up to be replaced because if you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. So if you don't learn how to delegate, if you don't learn how to pass pass on that knowledge that's in your head, and teach others how to do these things so that you can then put your eyes on the next step in the ladder if you if you want to advance, then you have to groom people behind you to take your place, and that comes through delegation. Yeah, it's so great you mentioned that. Like for entrepreneurs, you know, there's this there's this kind of rule of thumb, if there's someone on your team that can do it like 70% as good as you can, you should just let them do it. And you go, well, wait a minute, the job's not getting that 70%, I could do it 100. Yeah, but you're doing it 100 means whatever you've been hired to do isn't getting done at all. Because you have to focus, I think, on what are the unique things the manager can do, the management hired to do? Because there's only one manager on the team, right? There could be five, 10 individual contributors. So better for the manager to focus on their unique things and let you know, the teamwork on those other items, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I feel this very acutely in my business uh, because there are certain things that only I can do. Like I'm the product. So I'm the one who designs, develops, and facilitates programs. I'm the secret sauce. Without Eric Girard, there is no Girard training solution. So I'm, I need to be in front of clients doing that. I can't delegate that. Um, I need to be the one doing marketing and sales because I am the company or I represent the company, but there's a universe of things that I am not as good at, not as skilled at, not as interested in that I need to delegate. And some of them were hard. There's going to be some grieving uh, as a new manager when, when you realize you have to let go of some stuff that you really like. So for example, I really enjoyed working on my website. I set it up. I got the, the bones of it going. And then I realized, whoops, I'm spending hours on the website and I really need to be doing business development. So that was the first thing I delegated was um, the website. The second thing I delegated, this was a painful lesson. I thought I could do everything. You know, I was holding on to everything myself because, you know, I saw myself as a solopreneur. So I was holding on to everything. And then I got QuickBooks self-employed and was using that to, to keep my books. And it was super simple. It was really easy. Just click this, click that, type in a few numbers and you're good. And then I gave, I gave the, the output, the file to my accountant. And my accountant in return gave me a bill for $1,000 to fix all the mistakes. So <laughs> that was the second thing <laughs> I let go of was I am not a bookkeeper. I don't have that muscle to think that granularly. So there's a lot of things that I've been able to let go of more and more willingly so that I can do what only I can do. And then I can let go and empower other people to do that. And in return, I love on my team like crazy. I, I make sure to praise them every day uh, for, for things that they're doing well. I catch them doing something right every single day and say so. And, and that's really important. 
I, I think that's awesome. Those are just great, great examples for managers and for entrepreneurs. Um, let me ask you this. Managers, at least in tech, right? A lot of us are managers in tech, especially that listen to this show. A lot of people in tech are, you know, they see themselves as geeky, dorks, introverted, not good with people. And when you're a manager now, you you actually operate in the realm of people and in the realm of relationships, right? You're no longer actually operating very much or you only have maybe one foot in the technical world. So how should new managers transition to this world of operating in people, which is very messy and fuzzy? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it that reminds me of a line out of my change management course, which is there are two sides to a change. There's the technical and the social side of change. You know, the technical running the project plan and getting all the the I's dotted and T's crossed and and the, the the things done easy. But helping the people affected by the change get through it is often neglected or downplayed. And most change fails not because it wasn't technically executed well. Most change fails because the social side of change wasn't addressed and, and people weren't consulted. They weren't bought in. They weren't, they weren't involved. So as a manager, I would say, you know, first off, I, there's, I think that there's real power in introversion. A lot of my friends are introverts. I'm clearly an extrovert. And I learn a lot from my introverted friends. And introverted doesn't mean quiet and shy. Introverted just means that you get your energy from being alone or being in much smaller groups. I, I get fueled by being around a lot of people. So there's nothing wrong with being introverted and being as a manager, being a manager. Those, those two things are not mutually exclusive. I, so, I agree. Yeah. I agree. The, the part about being geeky and, um, you know, kind of a dork, I'm a geek, I'm a dork. So what, you know, <laughs> ask my kids, they would, they would totally agree with that. It, I, I think that the geekiness and dorkness from my perspective comes from being really super focused on one thing that you're really good at and you can go really, really deep on it. You can geek out on AI. You can geek out on learning and development. You can geek out on scuba diving, which I love to do. The, that's, that again is not antithetical to being a good manager. I think the trick is to be able to start with the basics and be able to, to begin a conversation well. All right. So, you know, just go back to basics. And when you meet somebody from the first time, being able to look someone in the eye, smile, give them a firm handshake, say, how are you? It's nice to meet you sort of a thing and start the conversation off on a really solid footing. And then, you know, as you get to know each other, you can reveal your geekiness and a lot of people will embrace that and go with it. One of the things that I talk about um, is the first and longest chapter in my book is uh, about empathy. And how I think that empathy is so, so important for all managers and, and especially these days for new managers with everything that's going on in the world, a manager needs to be empathetic to the needs of their team. And that doesn't mean that you become a therapist. It doesn't mean that you get a personality transplant. It means that maybe you read one book. Maybe you read Daniel Goleman's book on emotional intelligence. Um, maybe you just put yourself in slightly uncomfortable positions. You, you go talk to people you wouldn't normally talk to uh, and ask questions and really get them talking about themselves. I'm not suggesting that you, you know, completely transplant yourself someplace that's just completely foreign, but just little by little, tiny steps at a time, start to see the world through other people's eyes, walk a mile in their shoes, just one step at a time. So building empathy, being being social without without feeling like you have to be ta da you know here I am I'm the center of attention you you don't have to do that but just being able to hold a conversation and ask questions and drawing other people out and getting getting them talking people people love to talk about themselves it's their favorite subject so ask questions about them and poof you've bonded and now you can start to to do a little trading of of resources and so on. Don't get me wrong. I think empathy is a great thing. And who wouldn't want to have an empathetic manager, right? That would be fantastic. I've had some managers who were empathetic and some who actually were very hardcore driven and really didn't care. Um, but let me ask you a question. In the tech industry, we idolize, or at least the media idolizes, let's say, a lot of people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, 
Elon Musk, for example, extremely successful. And I don't think anyone would say they're very empathetic at all, characters. So talk a little about that. You know, you say it's important to be empathetic, but did some of the pinnacle of success in the industry, depending how you define it, not very empathetic. No, and I would agree. I think I think you named two, three good examples. Um, I would set Bill Gates a little aside from that because he's done so much philanthropic work that I think his deeds are pretty empathetic. Like he's he's empathetic to I humanity. Think he's trying to make up for it. Actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a penance. <laughs> yeah, I never I never worked at Microsoft, so I I don't have any stories. But I did work at Apple, and I showed up at Apple right after Steve died. And so as part of my, uh, my preparation for the interview process and for getting ready to, to, to go work at Apple, I read every book I could get my hands on about Steve Jobs. And then I talked to a lot of people who worked there when Steve was walking around. And it was terrifying. He was absolutely terrifying. If you got into an elevator with Steve and he asked you a question, you couldn't answer it, you were packing your bags right then and there. Absolutely. You know, if he asked you what you did for the company and you couldn't convince him that, that you were adding value in the time it took to ride your elevator, however many floors, you were gone. Wow. And, you know, I just, I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's the way to run a company. I don't think that that's the way to run a team. Yes. Incredibly successful. Brilliant. And I think, I think I would trade just a notch less brilliance for just a notch more or three more notches of just being a, a human people can relate to. So I, I have worked with a lot of executives in Silicon Valley. I spent, spent 20 years in Silicon Valley and I worked with a lot of executives who were incredibly approachable and very, very easy to talk to and kind. And I have better memories of them, even though they're not on the Forbes 10 list or whatever. Um, I have better memories of them, and I think they got more out of their people than, for example, Steve Jobs, who scared the blank out of people and and just terrified terrified people. I, I yeah, I I mean, I I realize that these are people who who did amazing things with their companies and made a lot of money. I think that today, a little more humanity and a little less terror terror is is needed in the in the in Silicon Valley and in the world. Okay, so the little bit kinder, gentler Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. It'd be interesting what they would be like. Um, I'm very passionate about diversity and inclusion. You know, I'm a minority myself. And since you coach new managers, is there any advice you have that's specific to underrepresented minorities or women in tech that might be different to what you might give a new manager who's like a white man? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I... Um... For the longest time, being a white middle class male was was the thing that you had to watch out for, and you had to be aware. Okay, you've got privileges that other people don't. And then I went to work for uh, an Indian owned company that was well, most of the leadership was Indian, and when they talked about diversity and inclusion, they talked about having uh, people other than Indian guys. So that was that was just really interesting. So. You know, as far as diversity and inclusion, the first thing I'll say is I'm not an ex I'm not an expert on on DE and I, and I think the 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 phrase that I would use to to anybody is think about your background for a second. Think about your your experience in life. Can you go where you want? Do you face any particular types of struggles? Um, are you marginalized because of the color of your skin, or because of your gender, or because of where you're from? If you're not, just remember that there are a lot of people around you who are. And again, we bring empathy back to that, you know, and just be be aware of the fact that you might be in a in a minority that has been privileged for a long time. So can you again get to know these folks? Uh, can you spend some time with them walking in their shoes metaphorically so that you kind of understand, okay, you know, life is not like this for everybody. Like my life, where I live, what I get to do is not the same um, for everybody um, around the world and, and even in my community. So it's, it's just a matter of being mindful of the fact that you may have privileges and experiences that other people just have never had. Okay. Um, and yes, I think it's relative. If you are in, like you said, an 
company that's all Indians or all Asians or something, right? Then the minority is like the reverse, perhaps, um, what we think about it. Um, like I'm a big fan of mentors. I think mentorship is very important. So if you're a new manager, um, you know, what'd be a good way to get a mentor? What'd be like good things to even have in a mentor, right? To help you as you're starting out. Excuse me. Um, I firmly believe in coaches and mentors. I'm, I've, I surround myself with coaches and mentors. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of a, kind of telling that in my early career, in my 20s, I knew everything, could do it all myself. Now here I am in my 50s, and I've got a ton of coaches and mentors and people who I ask for advice and allow to speak into my life. So I would say as a new manager, absolutely seek out wisdom from people who have been there, done that before you. And it doesn't have to be somebody who has been a manager for 30 years. You know, you don't, you don't have to seek those folks out if you don't want to. It's, that certainly wouldn't hurt. But somebody who's been doing it a year or two longer than you would be very useful. And talking to people outside of your immediate sphere of influence. So for example, I'm in learning and development and learning and development is usually part of HR. So my peers and the people around me would usually be L and D folks or would be uh, HR folks. And so I would deliberately go make friends with people in engineering or in marketing or in sales and, and spend some time over coffee talking to them and getting some wisdom that way. And then being willing and available to share what you learned back to somebody else. So make sure it's a two-way interchange. You know, you learn something, turn around and share it with somebody else and, and just keep that cycle going. I think that's, that's really great. Um, may just make it a little more tactical because I know like for my engineers, a lot of them struggle to find a mentor, right? How do I get a mentor exactly? And, and also you mentioned coaches. Like, do you think, New managers, these coaches normally have to pay money for them, right? Would you pay for a coach? How exactly would you find a mentor? I wonder if you could share a little more. Okay. So in terms of, let me, let me answer the last one first. So coaching at the last company I worked at in Silicon Valley, we offered coaching to everybody. We called it speed coaching and we had a cadre of coaches. We had, um, I think it was 10 coaches who would come in for a day. We would book meeting rooms for them, and then we would set up half-hour coaching sessions for anybody who wanted to come. And people would, after they came a few times, started to, to become familiar and comfortable with a particular coach. So they would only want to talk to Mike, for example. So we made it very democratic and made coaching available to everybody. That, wow. That, I've yeah. never heard of this. I've never seen this in any company I worked at. That's oh, amazing. It's, you know, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's, it's a logistic, it's a logistical lift. It takes, it takes a program manager or two to make it all come off. You know, if you're going to try to fill these rooms every half hour for a full day, it takes a lot of shuffling, but the payoff is, you know, people feel invested in and, and they feel like they're being heard by somebody who's not just their manager, not just their best friend at work, but somebody who's a professional who can give some some good insight into to the challenges that they're facing. So I really recommend it. Um, not it's yeah, you know, quite often, like we were able to negotiate with these coaches. Uh, they would come in with a, with an hourly rate, you know, Hey, this is my hourly rate. And we would say, well, this is a program that's going to happen over time. Like it's going to be repeated. So would you consider a lower hourly rate in exchange for a pipeline of work? And that worked with everybody. So we were able to negotiate with these coaches and it worked really well. So it's not even that expensive. Well, okay, but that's if you're a company or like if you're the CEO or you're a leader and you can set that up for your company. But what if you're just like, you know, a typical manager that works in a company that doesn't have that system? Like, would you recommend them to go hire a coach? Well, you know, I'm thinking about my wife's company. She works for a small startup. They're, um, they're under 100 people and they have a coaching benefit through their, through their HR through their HR um, department. Okay. Um, I think it's Modern Health is is the app that they're using. And they get free, everybody in the company gets free coaching. They get 10 free coaching sessions um, through Modern Health. So that's pretty remarkable as well, which I, you know, I thought that was a pretty neat thing to do. But, 
let's say that that's not available to you. So speed coaching doesn't happen in your company and um, your, your company isn't offering an app that allows you to have coaching. I would still seriously consider doing it out of your pocket because uh, I believe in it that much. If you can find the right coach and if you can work with him, you know, if, if the, if the fee is, is a little steep, maybe work with him on a rate. Um, there are so many good coaches that can provide such great insight that can really propel you in your career as a manager. I would really consider it. I would, I would consider maybe making some adjustments to your finances so that you can afford 10 coaching sessions. Um, that'll make a huge difference. And how about finding a mentor? Like giving advice, like specifically how to get a mentor. This goes to the N word. This goes to networking and you've got to, you've got to broaden your network and start to talk to people. So talking to people and, and the way that I like to find almost any kind of service provider, uh, whether it's somebody helping me write my book or my website or, um, paint my house or cut my grass is I always talk to people I know and ask them, who do you know who can do X? Who do you know? So in the, in the case of mentoring, who do you know who would be a great mentor? So I am uh, a new engineering manager. I've been doing this for six months. I'm having some roadblocks. I'm looking to talk to an experienced manager in engineering who can help give me some perspective on these kinds of issues. Do you know anybody? And just tapping your network, starting with the people you know, asking them for referrals. If that doesn't pan out, asking that person for referrals and so on. So it becomes like a ring. Of, of referrals outward until you eventually narrow it down to, to someone who you want to spend time with and be mentor, mentored by. I think that's really good. Uh, I try to do that too. So rather than just say, you know, I just, I just need like a mentor in general. It's like, I have this specific problem, right? I trying to figure out how to do this or be better at that. Do you know someone who's really good at that? I think that's what you're saying. And then you go to the person you get their advice on this topic. And then if you hit it off, then you might, you know, come back to them and ask advice on a different topic. And I think the relationship can kind of grow organically like that. I think it's good to have a specific thing to start with. It helps. And, and you, you don't have to limit yourself to just one mentor because you're going to have mentors who specialize in different things. Mentors, I've got a mentor who helps me with my book. I've got a mentor who helps me with my business. So things like that can be, can be helpful. Um, and some mentoring relationships are long-term. Uh, my, my old manager, Brent, my first manager in Silicon Valley, um, he, I met him in 1999 and we still talk. He's still my mentor um, because he's got such great wisdom. I had a, a mentoring relationship in my last company that lasted two months. That's okay. That's fine. You know, it, it, it was for a certain thing for a certain period of time and we decided to call it good and then we walked away and that was that. So, you know, mentoring doesn't mean necessarily you're committed forever sort of a thing. It's, it, you can, you can be mentored in one shot and just one conversation. Okay. Eric, say a little bit about the importance of trust. How do you establish trust, restore trust? Like, uh, I know you're very passionate about trust. Yeah, absolutely. So this comes from Patrick Lencioni's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Love that book. It's it's uh, It was written a while ago, but it still holds up. And, and I love Lencioni's work because it's easy to read. It's easy to grasp and understand. He writes in parables a lot of the time. So it's it's just a, it's a fun, entertaining read, and he just drops serious knowledge. So it's, if you it's think a great about, book. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So if you, if you take, if you, if you imagine a pyramid at the base of it is trust and at the top of it is results. If you don't have that foundation of trust where people simply do what they say they will do. So I, I, for a while I had a post it on my monitor that had the initials for do what you say you will do on my monitor. And I would stare at that every day. Just starting with that, you know, if you give somebody your word, yes, I will have the TPS report done by September 30th, and you hand it in October 2nd, you have failed and you have broken trust. If you hand it in on September 18th, plus points for you, as long as it's also accurate, right? As long as, long as you didn't rush it and, and skip something. So starting with, with keeping commitments, and, and I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do, I'm going to hold confidences. If you tell me something in confidence in a one-on-one, -on -one, you're struggling with something, 
you're not going to hear about it from somebody else. Like I'm not, I'm going to keep my mouth shut when you, when you, um, when you share something with me, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got your back. So if if you're struggling with something, I'm not going to kick you while you're down. I'm going to give you a hand up and help you out. So those to me are all things that, that help build trust right, right away. And it's, it's not usually a one and done thing. It's usually trust is a small series of deposits into a bank account. And, you know, little by little, you keep, keep, you keep keeping commitments. You keep helping me out when I need a hand. I tell you something twice and I never hear about it again from anybody else. Three times. I never hear about it from anybody else. Small things like that. I'm just illustrating small things like that help build trust so that, you know, if, when I come to you with something big, like I've got a diagnosis that really scares me or my family is struggling or something like that. I trust you to, to treat it properly and to help me through that. That's huge. That's massive. Um, so those, those are, those are some of the things I would do to, to advise a manager to start building trust with their team. And then also as the manager, you're also, you know, you're looked up to, um, the manager often defines reality for the team and so the way that you act, the way that you speak, the way that you you are in front of other people, your team is watching you. And if they can't trust you to act appropriately, then boom, you know, trust is gone. But if they see you acting professionally, if they if they see you representing well, um, if they know that you've got the team's best interest in mind when when you go to the senior manager's meeting, that all helps as well. So those are just some examples. I just want to add on what you said, because I think you mentioned a couple of times at a one-on-one, maybe somebody says something and then you don't tell anyone else. And I think that's really important, right? I've also seen the reverse where a manager, like I once told something to a direct report of mine at a one-on-one. And then later I heard from my VP, why did you tell this person that thing, right? So it goes both ways. I think it's very uh, and obviously that ruined the trust I had with that direct report too. Eric, I know that you're writing a book. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about your book that's coming out? Yeah. So it is called Lead Like a Pro, The Essential Guide for New Managers. And it it covers a lot of what I just touched on during this conversation. So the whole idea is you're a new manager or maybe you're considering management. Maybe you're management curious um, and, and you just want to see what it's about. Uh, this book is for you. So it's all about you know everything from bringing empathy all the way through to managing change. And, um, you know, it's not a massive thick book, you know, it's not going to be something that takes you weeks and weeks to read. Uh, it's got actions, it's action oriented. So at the end of every chapter, there's an opportunity for you to try something, go put it into practice. And then uh, the last chapter is a personal grand plan where you put together, okay, I spent the time to read this book. What am I going to do differently as a result of that? And that's what I do on my classes as well is, We'll spend, let's say we'll spend six hours together and folks have enjoyed themselves. They've, they've done a lot of learning and getting a lot of insight. And then I ask them to pause and write down kind of a commitment to themselves. What are you going to do differently because you spent this time? You know, your, your time is valuable. So let's make sure you get a payoff for that. So I, it'll- I love that. All right, sorry to interrupt. I love that because I've read so many books and I've gone to so many seminars and I've learned so many things and yet never <laughs> applied them afterwards. Mm -hmm. so. Happens all the time. Happens to me. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it'll be out September 20th. It's going to be on Amazon. It'll be a paperback, uh, a Kindle ebook, and an audiobook. Awesome. I look forward to it. I think it's going to be great. Um, Eric, if people wanted to reach out to you afterwards, maybe to talk with you more or learn about you, what would be the best way? Yeah. So probably the easiest thing is LinkedIn. So I'm Eric Gerard on LinkedIn. Um, I've got a, I post three times a week, at least three times a week on LinkedIn. So uh, welcome you to follow me there. And then you can always shoot me an email, eric at gerardtrainingsolutions.com. Okay, great. I'll put some links to that in the notes. Uh, eric, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great to talk with you and I wish you all success with your book. Thank you very much. And, and you as well. I hope things go well with your, your venture. Thank you.